Welcome back to the McMaster University course, Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. Uh, my name is Bill Farmer, and we're going to continue with the topic of Turing machines and computability. And today we're going to talk about the great limitation theorems. The great limitation theorems are theorems about the limits of what we can do with computing and what we can do with mathematics, what we can do with logic. Uh, there's, there's four of these. The first is called the first completeness theorem. This is a theorem proved by Kurt Gödel in 1931. And this theorem says that if we have a proof system, any proof system that's consistent, sufficiently strong, and recursively axiomatizable, then we cannot prove all the truths of natural number arithmetic. So there is no system that has these three properties in which we can prove all the truths in natural number arithmetic. Whatever system we have, there will always be something that's true about the natural numbers we can't prove. So what are these three properties? Consistent means that we can't prove, we can't prove in our system falsehoods, which we would expect our system to be like that if it's going to be useful. Sufficiently strong means we can prove some basic things about numbers and lists and so forth. Recursively axiomatizable means that we can write a computer program that can tell us whether a rule or an axiom belongs to our proof system. Now, almost every proof system anyone uses is recursively axiomatizable. Uh, the goal is always to have a proof system that's consistent. Sufficiently strong just means it's strong enough to, to do some basic things, and I'll make sufficiently strong more precise in a moment. So I'll repeat. There is no proof system that has these three properties that can prove all the truths of natural number arithmetic. So this shows that natural number arithmetic is, is fundamentally beyond what we can get at using just proving. Okay, so that's the first incompleteness theorem. The second is no consistent, sufficiently strong, recursively axiomatizable proof system can prove its own consistency. Now, consistency means it doesn't prove falsehoods. So if we take a system, if it's consistent, sufficiently strong, and recursively axiomatizable, we can't prove in that system that the system itself is consistent. The only thing we can do is prove that the system is consistent in a stronger system. And then that begs the question, well, is that stronger system consistent? Well, we can prove that that is consistent in some stronger system. So this is a fundamental limitation of, of what we can do about showing that a system is consistent. So basically, systems have these three properties. We can't really show that they're consistent. We can't prove that they're consistent. Because in order to do that, we need a stronger system than the system itself. The third great limitation theorem is the theorem of undefined definability of truth. This was proven by Alfred Tarski, 1933. By the way, both of the incompleteness theorems were proved in the same paper by Kurt Gödel in 1931. So Tarski showed that truth cannot be defined in any sufficiently strong theory. So if you have a sufficiently strong theory and you'd like to define truth, you like to say that at a come up with a way of characterizing whether a statement is true or not, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can define the truth of a system, the truth of a system within a stronger system, but not within the system itself. And finally, the last great limitation theorem is that first order logic is undecidable. This was proven by Alonzo Church, 1936. What that means is, we can't decide 
using a computer program or any kind of computable function whether a given formula of first order logic is valid or not. So, so these are these are these theorems severely limit what we can do with with logic and computing. Okay, so I have a I have a question for you. The question is, the great limitation problem state that there are limits on what can be, and you have a choice of proved, defined, computed, or all of the above. Okay, so I'm going to give you a moment. You can stop your video, come up with your answer. Okay, well, welcome back. The answer is this. All of the above. The great limitation theorems, they, they state limits in all three of these. And what can be proved, what can be defined, and what can be computed. Now to make this, these theorems more concrete, I'd like to look at a first order theory called Robinson arithmetic. So Robinson arithmetic is a first order theory, so the first order si signature has the constant zero, the unary function symbol successor, and the functions plus or times. It is a theory for natural number arithmetic. And it has seven axioms. The first axiom here says that zero is not the successor of anything. So the successor of, let's say, three is four, so you know what successor means. The second says successor is injective. So if the successor of x equals the successor of y, then x equals y. The third says every, every in this case, natural number is going to be either 0 or the successor of something. And then these two are the recursive definitions for addition, which you've seen before. And these are the recursive additions for multiplication, which you've seen before. That's it. That's Robinson arithmetic. This is named after... Raphael M. Robinson, who discovered it. And this theory is very interesting. As I said, it's a theory of natural number arithmetic. It is a sub-theory of the more well-known theory of natural number arithmetic, first order piano arithmetic. First order piano arithmetic has these axioms plus the induction, the, the induction schema, the schema that corresponds to weak induction. Axiom 3, that's the one that says every natural number is either 0 or a successor of something. It is used in place of the induction schema. Now, without the induction schema, this theory, which, by the way, is often designated as Q, this theory is very weak. It's a theory of natural number arithmetic, but it's very weak. Uh, we can't prove the associative laws or the commutative laws for addition and multiplication or the distributive law. We can't even prove the, the theorem that says for all natural numbers, a successor of the natural number is not the natural number itself. We can't even prove that. Um, these are not logical consequences of Q. The interesting thing is we can prove all the instances of these laws, of these logic, these, these uh, laws or these statements. For instance, I can prove that 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 2. I can prove that in Robinson arithmetic. I cannot prove for all x, for all x and y, x plus y equals y plus x. I cannot prove that. This system is too weak. So, so the, the interesting thing is these limitation theorems apply to Q, even though Q is so weak. And uh, we don't know, we can't prove that Q is consistent in itself, but it's very likely that Q is a consistent system. It's very unlikely that we can prove falsehoods from Q. So it's consistent. It is sufficiently strong. In fact, we can use it as a definition of sufficiently strong. 
a theory is sufficiently strong if it can do whatever Q can do. And it's recursively axiomatizable. Remember, that means we can use a computer program to determine what are the rules or and axioms of our proof system. Uh, it's recursively axiomatizable because there are only seven axioms. So it's very, we can easily write a program to recognize these seven. Okay. Um, and Q illustrates the force, fourth limitation theorem because it is an undecidable first order theory. If you write down, if you write down any formula, uh, if we just pick any formula in this theory, so it's going to involve successor and plus of times, there's no computer program that can tell whether that formula is valid or not. So if we think now about the meta theorems of Q, these are not the theorems we prove in Q, but the theorems about Q, which we call meta theorems. We can first say that Q is finitely axiomatizable, has finite number of axioms. Therefore, it's recursively axiomatizable. It is incomplete, and that means that there are truths about the natural numbers that we cannot prove in Q. It's incomplete. But more than that, every consistent, recursively axiomatizable extension of Q is complete. So if there's something we can't prove in Q, and we add that as an axiom, there will still be something we can't prove in Q. And you can do that over and over again, the, and you'll never, you'll never get a theory in which you can prove everything unless that theory is, becomes inconsistent or it becomes so complex that we can't even tell what our axioms are or not. This is called essentially incomplete. Not only is it incomplete, but every consistent recursively axiomatizable extension of Q is incomplete. And um, consistency cannot be proved in Q. And we can't prove consistency in any recursively axiomatizable extension of Q. And truth is not definable in Q. And Q is undecidable. There's no computer program will tell us what is valid in Q, as I said before. But more than that, it's essentially undecidable, which means Every consistent extension of Q, that means every, every theory I get by adding more axioms to Q, that's going to be undecidable. And as I said before, we can, we can think of, of a theory being sufficiently strong if we can embed Q in it in some way. So the interesting question is, how did Robinson ever come up with this amazing theory? Well, what he did was he analyzed... He analyzed Kurt Gödel's proof of the first incompleteness theorem, and he basically used he used only the axioms he needed about natural number arithmetic to make sure Kurt Gödel's proof went through. And the axioms he discovered that were needed are the axioms here, these seven axioms of Robinson arithmetic. Okay, we'll stop here. And next time, we're going to start with the very interesting and important topic of Turing machines. So see you then.